wow, you're all so nice and quiet. We never have nice and quiet here. We're impressed. So welcome, everybody. We are thrilled to have you here. Um, I'm Sue Thomas, the proud president of Truman State University, and we couldn't be any prouder than to hold this event today. So before we get started, and I have the honor of introducing President Bullard, I did want to thank the Board of Alliant Bank because their support helped make this wonderful visit possible. So thank you very much to Alliant. And I get the real honor and privilege of introducing President James Bullard. As you know, he's the President and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. And in case you didn't know, the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis oversees the activity of the 8th Federal Reserve District, and it's headquartered in St. Louis, Missouri, but it also has branches in Little Rock, Arkansas, Louisville, Kentucky, and Memphis, Tennessee. President Bullard earned his PhD in economics from Indiana University, so he's a good Midwesterner, I guess. And his BS degrees in economics and in quantitative methods and information systems from St. Cloud State University in Minnesota. He's also a prominent econo economist and scholar. According to research papers in economics, President Bullard's working paper abstracts have been viewed 29,329 times, and the papers themselves have been downloaded 8,953 times. When you look at his journal articles, those abstracts have been viewed 25,446 times, and the articles themselves have been downloaded 7,424 7, times. I'm not sure there's many of us in this room that could compare to those kinds of downloads and viewings. His most cited item was published as a working paper by the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis in 2002 and is entitled Learning About Monetary Policy Rules. Now here's what's really interesting about that. This work was also published in the Journal of Monetary Economics in 2002 and it was the most downloaded item in the past 12 months of all of his publications. But luckily for us, a priority for President Bullard is his public outreach and dialogue, and we are so honored and pleased to have him in Kirksville today to discuss three questions for U.S. monetary policy. So will you please join me in giving a very warm welcome, the Kirksville way, to President Bullard. Well, good afternoon, and thanks for having me here. Uh, it's real, really a pleasure to be here, as uh, we like to get around the district and meet everybody on the ground. And I'm looking forward to our Q&A session, uh, which will be later on uh, after I uh, finish my uh, slide deck here. Uh, the deck uh, interacts with, uh, with just sort of level sets people. Uh, I know some of you follow monetary policy closely. I was just talking to some of you, uh, and others maybe not as closely. So we'll try to uh, level set people on what's going on in my world, and, uh, and then uh, we'll go to the Q&A session from there. But then you can ask whatever you want. Uh, there are a lot of things that aren't in this deck, uh, and I'd be happy to talk about them. Um, I think overall, uh, just to give you some background uh, about how the Fed works, um, the I always like to say there are three parts to the Fed. There's a Washington component, there's a Wall Street component, and there's a Main Street component. I'm part of the Main Street component, uh, uh, and my fellow uh, presidents at uh, the 11 reserve banks outside of New York are part of that. Um, the idea was to decentralize the central bank, allow input on important uh, financial matters from around the country, and not allow this to all be dominated by uh, what's going on in New York and Washington, D.C., or the, even the East Coast generally. So uh, that was a deliberate decision 100 years ago by the framers of the Federal Reserve. And uh, I relish the role. I like playing it. And uh, I think it's an important role. And I think it's uh, uh, served us well as a country. The other parts of the Fed are the New York Fed, which is uh, uh, very important, uh, our connection to Wall Street. And of course, the Washington component, which has uh, seven governors uh, at full strength, the seven, seven governors of the Board of Governors, 
including our current chair of the Federal Reserve Board, uh, Janet Yellen. So uh, if you put the 12 presidents together with the seven governors of the uh, board in Washington, you get 19 people. That is the Federal Open Market Committee, and that's the primary policymaking committee of the Federal Reserve. Uh, I serve on that. Uh, a lot of people, the voting rotates. A lot of people ask about that. I wouldn't pay any attention to that. I think all people get, uh, all members get to uh, participate in all meetings. They get to uh, make comments about what's going on in uh, their part of the country at every single meeting. And so it's really a story about uh, collective judgment of the committee uh, about where we should go with monetary policy. And what is the, in, what is the decision that's being made there? It's really uh, short-term interest rates, uh, which tend to affect all interest rates in the economy. So it is important, very important for financial markets. And uh, uh, we do try to uh, get as much input as, uh, give as much input as we can from the 8th Federal Reserve District. I think the other thing to keep in mind about my role is that, uh, as was mentioned in, in the introduction, the eighth, this is the 8th Federal Reserve District. Uh, this sprawls across set parts of seven states, uh, and so it's not just uh, Missouri, and it's not just St. Louis. It's, uh, it's really spreading around the country. And just to give you a flavor of that, the, the largest firms in the 8th District are uh, Walmart stores in Bentonville, Arkansas. Uh, FedEx is in uh, Memphis, Tennessee. Yum Brands is in Louisville, uh, Kentucky. Uh, the largest firm in St. Louis today is Express Scripts, about number 23 or so on the Fortune 500 list. So you've got, uh, that shows you a little bit about the geography and the diversity of kinds of companies that we have uh, in the 8th Federal Reserve District. And I, I might also mention just one other thing that before I get started, that the, uh, you might think it's mostly an agricultural district, and obviously agriculture would be very important here, uh, but actually the mix of industry is about the same as it is for the nation as a whole. So I think uh, it's not that the 8th Federal Reserve District is dramatically different from the rest of the country as far as industrial mix. I think what is different is two things. Um, we don't have the very large banks that you see on the East Coast, uh, J.P. Morgan, uh, Bank of America. We don't have that in the Midwest here. And we also don't have Silicon Valley in the Midwest here, although there are uh, some startups around uh, that are very promising and, and there's a lot going on in that space, but it's certainly not uh, the same as what's going on in the Bay Area. So, uh, so those two things have been very important in uh, the whole the economy as a whole. Those are not part of the Midwest, but other than that, uh, the uh, industrial mix is very similar. So let me get on to uh, three questions uh, for U.S. monetary policy. Um, and uh, you know, I'm just gonna. If you don't want to listen to the whole talk, I'll just put it on one slide for you here. So. Uh, uh, the U.S. remains in a slow growth regime. This is something I've been talking about, and I'm going to have a whole bunch of slides on that. Uh, it's really not uh, as good as it has been in the whole post-World War II era. It's somewhat slower than that, and that's been the case since the uh, financial crisis. The biggest issue in monetary policy, if you haven't been following it, is that inflation has surprised to the downside during 2017, so I'll show you some pictures of that and what people are talking about on that. Uh, U.S. labor market performance has been pretty good, uh, but uh, I'm going to have some, some comments on that. I don't think that that's going to feed back to inflation, but we'll talk about that. And so uh, given these three, first three bullet points, the implications for monetary policy are that the policy rate, that's the rate set by the Open Market Committee, uh, is likely, the current level is likely to remain appropriate uh, going forward. So the questions would be, uh, based on that, the questions would be, you know, okay, we've been in slow growth mode, but maybe in the second half of 2017, which is where we are today, maybe growth is suddenly going to perk up uh, maybe to 3%. <laughs> That has been a story that's been told during 2017. And so that's the first question. Is that what's going to happen, that the second half of 2017 will be better than the first half? Uh, 
I'll talk about that quite a bit. Um, is the downside inflation surprise in the first half of 2017 uh, likely to suddenly reverse itself in the second half of 2017? Uh, we'll talk about that one. And finally, will the uh, strong labor markets lead to higher inflation? And the answer to all these questions is no. So I'm kind of Dr. No. Uh, <laughs> so I don't think any of these things are happening, even though uh, some people have talked this way that all these three of these things are happening. I don't think any of them are happening. So this is what's leading me to keep my current position of that rates are fine where they are. We don't need to really preempt uh, new things happening in the U.S. economy. So let's start with the first one. Will real, real GDP growth be higher in the second half of 2017? Real GDP is the way we measure uh, total output in the economy, also total income in the economy, same thing. Um, will it be higher in the second half? And, and since the financial crisis ended, the growth rate has been about 2%. Uh, so that's quite a while now. Uh, the recession ended in 2009. We're in 2017, so it's quite a while. If you look at uh, the growth rate for the first half of 2017, so that's averaging across the first quarter and the second quarter, it's 2.1 percent. And uh, people told a story that second half was going to be better than that, maybe all the way to 3 percent in the second half of 2017, which is where we are today. But, um, uh, you know, I don't think that's what's going to happen. So the 2 percent growth rate uh, looks like it's going to remain intact. So here's the picture uh, going from 2009 all the way up to the present on the horizontal axis. There's a horizontal line at 2 percent there. And then the blue line is the actual growth rate. So it was really low during the recession, negative. And then it came back up, and it's bounced around. But it really hasn't deviated much from 2% through that whole time. So I'm calling that a 2% growth regime. And even today, we're not very far off that 2% number. Uh, really, the best we were doing was at the first, say, January of 2015, where we were actually over 3%. Uh, but really not, not too far from 2 percent on average over this whole period. So um, two developments have dampened the hopes that we would get to 3 percent growth during 2017. Uh, one of those is that uh, the macroeconomic data that we get uh, every day uh, has, generally speaking, come in weaker during the August and September time frame. And because of that, uh, uh, forecast for third quarter GDP growth have um, been marked down. I'm going to have a picture of that. And secondly, uh, as many of you know, there's been this tragic damage from the hurricanes, both uh, on the human side but also on the economic side. Uh, lots of damage from hurricanes in two of our biggest states, uh, Texas and Florida, uh, Houston, Texas, one of the biggest cities in the U.S., also off the coast on the, in the Gulf have a lot of uh, a lot of oil rigs out there. They're uh, also damaged during the hurricane. So lots of uh, human tragedy, but lots of economic tragedy as well. And so both those things are, are um, a downdraft to third quarter GDP growth. Now, the way this works, the way storms work, is you get a lot of damage, uh, and then there's rebuilding afterwards. And so we do expect a rebound in the fourth quarter. So a lot of this is a game about well, how much damage do you think was caused in the third quarter, and how much of a rebound do you think there's going to be in a fourth quarter? And then if you average across those two quarters, are you going to get, let's say, 3 percent growth? And I'm saying probably not. So here's the uh, tracking estimates for third quarter uh, real GDP growth. We're just at the end of the third quarter now, but the way this works in the macroeconomic world is you're always looking in the rearview mirror, and you don't get the data until later. Uh, but the estimates for third quarter growth uh, as of early, or early to mid-August are given in the second and third column there. And some of those numbers are pretty high. Uh, Atlanta Fed GDP now 3.6 percent. Our own news index 3.7 percent. Uh, Macroeconomic advisors close to 3 percent. So you had some kind of high numbers, high hopes for the third quarter. Now you look in the third and fourth column at, uh, as we got into September here, 
All these things have been marked down quite a bit. Some of that's hurricane. Some of that's just weak data that we've gotten on other, on other dimensions. And now everybody's thinking uh, quite a bit less than what they were thinking uh, as of early August. This will all get uh, settled when we actually get a number uh, from the government on how fast GDP grew in the third quarter, but we won't get that until 30 days after the end of the quarter, which is going to be late October. Here's the estimates of hurricane damage from Goldman Sachs, Macro Advisors, Moody's, Oxford Economics. They're all ranging from four-tenths of one percent at an annual rate up to eight-tenths of one percent at an annual rate. So there certainly is a tangible uh, feel from what happened with the hurricanes. Again, a lot of that will come bounce back uh, in the fourth quarter. So to get some measure of underlying uh, uh, strength in the economy, you have to kind of average across those two. So. Um, Hopes for faster growth in the second half of 2017 have been tempered by weaker data and hurricane damage. There will be some rebound in the fourth quarter, uh, but whether this is going to be significant enough to move us off our 2% trend, I think, is really the question. Uh, and I just don't see – we're not going to really know the answer to that question until when. 30 days after the end of the fourth quarter, which is going to be the end of January. So you really aren't going to know uh, in the November, December time frame whether this, how this is all panned out and how, the, uh, how much bounce back there was from the hurricane and how much, of it, how much of the slower growth in the third quarter was just slower growth and how much of that was due to uh, hurricane damage. So I think the idea that we're, gonna, we're suddenly moving off this 2% growth trend, I think the answer to that question is probably not. So let's move to the second question. Will the low inflation trend uh, reverse itself in 2017? Uh, U.S. inflation has been below the Fed's official 2% target uh, since 2012. So we're talking five years now of, of uh, not meeting our, uh, our inflation target. Some of you that are in business would, if you didn't meet a target for five years in a row, you'd probably get fired. Uh, please don't do that to me. I appreciate it if you keep me in the job. Um, inflation, and then we were getting really close to meeting the 2% inflation target as of January this year. And then all of a sudden, a lot of data came in, and again, uh, where, where inflation has moved uh, quite a ways from target again. And uh, so it's calling into question the idea that U.S. inflation is reliably uh, returning to target. So here's the picture of, excuse me, personal consumption expenditures inflation in the U.S. We've got two lines here. This is going back uh, to 2012. And uh, the blue line is headline inflation. So that's uh, our target is in terms of headline inflation. And um, that's the one you should really uh, look at. But the, inflation, the headline inflation number is importantly influenced by oil prices and gasoline prices. And because of that, it tends to bounce around a lot. And you can see that in this picture, the blue line, especially in 2014, uh, which is uh, cut off here. But the, it's this big uh, drop here in the middle of the graph. Um, that's because oil prices in 2014, in case you weren't following students here, uh, they fell from $100 uh, dollars a barrel basically down to $50 a barrel and for a time went even down to $30 or $25 a barrel. And then they stayed low after that. So the headline inflation number plunged in twenty second half of 2014 all the way down close to zero here. And it took a whole year for that to come up. But it's been climbing uh, since then. And you can see at the end of the graph, the blue line briefly goes above the 2% inflation target. And then what happens, it goes back down again. So this last part is what people are talking about uh, during 2017. The gold line is the uh, core PC inflation rate. That's the favorite inflation measure of a lot of my colleagues, although it's not mine, uh, but I'll show it to you anyway. Uh, they, this measure takes out food and energy. Um, 
I have not liked it because people have to buy gasoline and people have to buy food. Uh, but nevertheless, if you want to get a kind of sense of what's going on with so-called underlying inflation, you might look at the core PCE inflation rate. That's the gold line. And that has been consistently under 2% since uh, January of 2012. It was coming back toward 2%, but now it has trended away again. And that is what people are talking about during uh, 2017. So here's another way to look at the data. Uh, this is a set of different ways to measure inflation. Uh, I'm not going to go through them all, but there's a bunch of different ways you could do it. Uh, these are listed as basis points in this table, so 258 means 2.58%. Um, the first, the second column there uh, indicates what these measures were saying. The year-over-year -year inflation rate was as of December 2016. That's when the Fed started to raise rates at a, a more uh, rapid pace. And then uh, the most recent observation is given in the third column, and the difference between those is given in the fourth column, all in red. All of it doesn't matter how you measure it. All these things have come down from where they were in December of 2016, which is when the Fed started uh, raising rates. So this is just another way to get at the same issue. You know, you might have had a uh, you know, 30, 40, 50 uh, basis point reduction in the measured inflation rate over this time period since December of last year. And here's the same thing visually. This is probably the best, uh, the best overall picture. This is the Dallas Fed uh, trim mean inflation rate. This is another way to measure inflation. And uh, this goes back to July, or sorry, January of 2015 on the horizontal axis. So this is, uh, what I like about this picture is it shows that, uh, you know, January of 2015 is about two and a half years ago. So over the last two and a half years, the Open Market Committee was telling a story that, hey, don't worry, inflation's climbing back toward the 2% target. We're making gradual progress to the target, which you can definitely see in this picture as the blue line climbs up toward the 2% uh, inflation target. And then all of a sudden, you get the circled data over there on the right, where, which is the 2017 inflation surprise in the U.S. And not only has all that progress, you know, not only did it drop, but much of the progress that we made uh, has all been uh, uh, erased. And now we're only as good as well off as we were at about uh, late 2015 or so. So this has been a surprise uh, to the downside. And the other thing about the Dallas Fed trim mean measure is that it already uh, throws out extreme price movements. So um, it is trying to get at the notion of underlying inflation or something like that over and above uh, what happens with energy prices. So this has been the inflation surprise. When you look at it in this picture, it's pretty big. It's pretty big. And this is a measure that already is supposed to be uh, measuring underlying inflation. So um, whether that's temporary, whether that's caused by noise, or whether there's something more fundamental going on in the economy, that is the argument that's being conducted in monetary policy circles. I've got this same picture for uh, P core PCE inflation, which I like less as a measure of underlying inflation, but because it still tends to be influenced by in, uh, energy prices. This is the exact same picture. It goes back to January of 2015, uh, so it's about two and a half years. For a long time, we could tell the story based on this that inflation was coming back to target. The dotted line is the trend line. It did look like it was all coming back, and then lo and behold, falls off a cliff in 2017. That's what people are talking about. So the, what's the bottom line on the 2017 inflation surprise? Uh, if you thought it was noise in the data, then you might think everything would balance out. Maybe we got some bad numbers early in the year. Maybe that would balance out late in the year, and it would all just look like noise at the end of the day. Um, but uh, the Open Market Committee itself has already projected what we think uh, core PC inflation will be at the end of the year, and it's 1.5% uh, at the end of uh, 2017. So it doesn't look like the committee thinks that we're going to be back to our 2% target or even that the inflation surprise will reverse itself by the end of 2017. So 
the committee has an important uh, December uh, meeting with a press conference. That's considered a focal point for upcoming decisions. Um, what are we going to be seeing at that point about inflation? Well, we're going to be seeing maybe 1.5, 1.6% on the core PC inflation rate. So it doesn't look like at that point that we'll have any confirmation that um, inflation is moving back to target more faster than uh, we previously thought. So will this trend reverse itself in 2017? Probably not. So the last, uh, er the last question of the three is uh, what about labor markets? Uh, I already said labor markets are uh, uh, strong, uh, have been pretty good in the US. I think the unemployment rate here, if I got the briefing right, is 3.6%. That's a pretty good number. And in fact, around the 8th district, uh, the unemployment rate is lower than it is in the nation as a whole. And so, you know, generally speaking, we are talking about strong labor markets. The question for monetary policy is whether those strong labor markets are going to translate into meaningfully higher inflation. And the answer to that is also no. So, <laughs> so uh, labor market performance, uh, uh, pace of growth and employment has been at or above expectations. Uh, unemployment is low. Will this drive inflation higher? Here's the non-farm payroll uh, chart. This goes back to January of 2012, so about five and a half years. And I like to show it this way. This is a uh, percent change from one year ago. A lot of times when people talk about the jobs numbers, they say, for those of you that follow this, they say things like 120,000 jobs are created, 180,000 jobs are created, 250,000 jobs are created. But I want to look, focus on the percent year over year because I think it's more informative and what you see in this picture is it peaked in January of 2015 at about 2.3 percent, and it's been on a slow decline ever since, down below 1.5 percent now. So job mark job growth has been slowing. Uh, very strong job markets. It has been slowing uh, over years pretty consistent. And here's the un unemployment rate. Uh, and here, this goes all the way back to 2006. You've got the shaded area is the recession and the crisis. So when the recession and crisis came along, uh, unemployment uh, exploded uh, and went up to two, uh, 10 percent in October of uh, 2009. And uh, ever since then, it's been uh, declining, although in recent years, if you squint at the right-hand part of this picture, it's been declining at a slower rate in the last year and a half to two years than it was. Uh, I like this picture because if you look at the pre-crisis unemployment rate, which is 2006, 2007, and you take the average over that period, that's the gold line in this picture. And you can see we've come all the way down to that level. So in, some, in 2006 and 2007, we're kind of a housing bubble. There's a lot going on in the economy. It's about as good as you can get and we're already down to that level. So we're probably uh, about as good as we can get on uh, unemployment for the U.S. economy, uh, uh, even though the most recent readings have actually been as low as 4.3, 4.4%. So we had 4.4% in August. Does that mean that inflation is about to take off and, uh, and is about to increase substantially? And the answer to this is no, and I'm going to cite some research on this. It's not my research. It's not even St. Louis Fed research. We'll take somebody else's uh, word for it. It's actually Olivier Blanchard, uh, who's uh, estimated a Phillips curve relationship for the U.S. based on very recent uh, data. And so um, the Phillips curve is a relation between unemployment and inflation. We don't need to get into the details. But uh, Blanchard has done all the work for us. He's got an equation. So what we'll do is we'll just imagine, suppose unemployment fell from 4.4% at the national rate today, down you know, another percentage point or even more than that. How much inflation would we get, according to Professor Blanchard? And uh, uh, that's what we're going to do in this picture. So this, this, uh, this chart shows in the first column what 
uh, Professor Blanchard would say if the unemployment rate was such and such in that column, uh, the predicted core PC inflation rate would be something in the right-hand column. We start out up at our no current numbers, which are 4.4% unemployment rate. That's our most recent reading. And uh, core inflation, 4% as of uh, August of the FCC is in the stat. And then the question is, suppose unemployment continues to fall, so go to 4%, go to 3.5%, go to 3%. Those of you that know uh, macroeconomic history for the U.S. know that we've been no nothing lower than 3.8 percent in recent macroeconomic history in the U.S., and that was associated with the tech bubble in 1999 and 2000. Uh, so 3.8 would be probably the absolute lowest you'd expect it to go in the U.S. But suppose unemployment went lower. What effect would that have on inflation, according to Professor Blanchard? That's what's in the, the – other column here, and you can see that unemployment does go up, or I'm sorry, inflation does go up when unemployment goes down, but according to those estimates in that research paper, only the most slight increases, about one-tenth of one percent if, uh, if unemployment went to four percent, another tenth if it went to three and a half percent, another tenth if unemployment went all the way down to three percent nationally, uh, we'd still only have 1.7 percent core PC inflation according to those estimates. So even in that case, which is a very extreme case, you'd be uh, unemployment would be uh, shockingly low for the U.S. economy. You'd still only get a few tenths on the inflation rate. You'd still be below your inflation target. You'd still be missing inflation to the low side because our inflation target is 2 percent. So uh, the effects on inflation are likely to be small according to this exercise. So let me conclude and uh, let's uh, let you think about your questions and, answer, or questions and answers if you want to give me the answers as well. Uh, but uh, think, about, think up your questions. I think you're going to have to come up front, by the way, if you want to ask a question so we can uh, keep everything on the video. Um, so there's an extra penalty if you want to <laughs> ask a, if you want to ask a question. But let me conclude here before we get to that. Um, I think that the recent data indicate that the U.S. economy is still on this 2 percent growth trend. There really isn't anything so far to indicate that we're breaking out of the 2 percent growth trend. And the hurricanes are just making the data all that much more cloudy. So it's going to be harder to tell uh, over the next six months uh, what really happened until we really get a reading on the fourth quarter, the, the, the um, expected rebound in the fourth quarter, and how strong that rebound really is. If it's very strong, then that would indicate that, indeed, we do have higher underlying growth. But if it's relatively weak, it would indicate that we're still at the 2 percent growth trend, and I'm betting on the 2 percent growth trend at this point. Um, on inflation, we've had this surprise uh, to inflation to the downside. Um, and that is unlikely to reverse during uh, 2017. So we're going to end up the year with core PC inflation at 1.5 or 1.6 percent, not, nothing too different from that. Low unemployment readings, uh, it's a joy to have great uh, labor markets, but it doesn't look like, based on current macroeconomic research, that that's going to translate into much inflation going forward. And so, uh, based on these factors, I think the current level of the policy rate is appropriate given current macroeconomic data. So let me, uh, so that's it, and uh, let's go ahead and go to the um, Q&A. You guys have been very attentive and uh, very quiet during my talk, so I'm expecting you to get, uh, now wake up and, uh <laughs> and uh, ask about anything that you want uh, outside of what I talked about here or anything that I did talk about. So. Thanks very much. I really appreciate it. <coughs> yeah, you might as well come up and line up if you want to ask a question or be faster. Hello. Thank Hi. you for uh, the, that presentation. That was really interesting. Um, 
So uh, you mentioned uh, two main reasons why the growth rate hasn't recovered. Uh, one is hurricanes, uh, which it seems like we've had hurricanes for a while, uh, even though they might be getting worse because of global warming. And we've uh, had you know significant hurricanes this year. Um, but uh, aside from like hurricanes, uh, you said there was like weak economic, uh, macroeconomic data that came back. Um, so I was wondering uh, what exactly might cause the data to come back weakly, and uh, what uh, what the fundamental difference between the U.S. economy now. Uh, what it, what the two percent growth regime might be versus the economy uh, in the post World War II period, with the uh, three percent growth regime. Yeah, I think it's a great question. On the, on the hurricanes, I think uh, they were special this year because uh, you know it, the first one, Irma uh, or uh, Harvey, uh, bore down directly on Houston and and stalled out over Houston, so you really got a major hit to a major city. And uh, the other hurricane, Irma, uh, went right up to Florida Panhandle and so caused a lot of damage through that. We do have a lot of hurricane or have hurricanes every year, a hurricane season every year, but exactly where they hit and whether they hit where we're trying to produce GDP is, is from a macro perspective, makes a lot of difference. I would say that um, the best analogy uh, for this one-two hurricane punch that we had this year is the 2005 uh, case where you had Hurricane Katrina uh, coming into uh, New Orleans, uh, which makes, uh, some of you might remember, and, uh, and then a hurricane coming right after that uh, and causing further damage. So that was uh, one-two punch that year as well. But this might be even more um, focused on areas this year that, that are actually, you know, Texas and Florida, two of our biggest states. So I think it really was important. I think the other part of the question um, is a very important question, which is, you know, before the crisis, you basically had 3% growth in the United States over a very long period of time from 1948 all the way up until 2007. And many things happened over that period and the economy transformed in many ways, but you still had 3% growth you know, on average. And even down times followed by good times and, and you still averaged out to 3%. Since the crisis, uh, it's really been 2%. And it's not just the US, it's other countries as well so what is it that has caused us to fall off that trend? Uh, the, the main answer to that question is productivity. Productivity improvement is your main driver of long-term growth, and it has been slow uh, in recent years compared to what it was over that post-war era. And um, why is productivity low? I think that's a great question for uh, some of your professors to answer in some of your classes. Um, um, I have ideas about it, but uh, you know, I don't want to get too far off track. But I think it's low productivity uh, has been uh, the key culprit in uh, low GDP growth. Uh, if you just wanted a simple model of growth, it would be how fast is the labor force growing and how fast is productivity growing. Labor force has been growing more slowly uh, than it was in most of the post-war era productivity also growing more slowly, so those two things together are giving us a, a slower growth rate. Uh, a lot of times people say there's all kinds of great technology around, why isn't that translating into higher productivity? And that's kind of the core question of the post-crisis era. Thank you again for speaking. Uh, sure. My question is, so you seem pretty concerned about the prospect of tightening policy too quickly. Are you at all concerned about the possibility of waiting too long to tighten policy? Well, I'm the most dovish member of the FOMC. Uh, I used to worry about uh, you know, inflation pressure. We'd get, we'd get behind the curve and we would end up with too much uh, stimulus and too much accommodation. Therefore, we'd end up with much inflation and, uh, and we get in trouble. But after years of forecasting incorrectly that that was going to happen, uh, we changed our model in uh, June of 2016, so we're about a year, a little more than a year into this. And I think it's been 
it's been a more successful way to think about what's going on in the U.S. economy. Not much is changing, and the global inflation environment is quite low, not just in the U.S., but in Europe and Japan and elsewhere. And because of that, uh, we probably are not in the situation that we were in in the 1970s where inflation kept ratcheting to higher levels and we had to, we were behind the curve and then we had to reestablish credibility, which all of, all of which I've internalized in my studies over the years. But the, uh, that's not the situation that we're in uh, today. We're in a different era. I think we have to internalize that we're in a different era. There does not appear to be a lot of inflation pressure in the U.S. economy or in the European or Japanese economies, which accounts for 50 percent of uh, world GDP, 40 percent of world GDP. So we're in a low inflation environment globally. Now we can argue about what's driving that low inflation environment and why that inflation pressure is low, but I think from a policy perspective, what you should do is take that on board, accept the evidence and uh, predict that that's going to continue going forward and then be alert to the possibility that the world will change again on us, which it might, uh, and then if it does, we'll have to react and we'll have to move aggressively. But, uh, but for now, I think uh, we do not need to be preemptive in trying to get ahead of inflation developments. <coughs> Hi, my name is Hi. Brian Kamsanka, and my question deals more with the operations of the Federal Reserve System. Um, within the past few years, we've seen a lot of uh, national programs and services being consolidated. For example, with Kansas City, we've seen the Treasury Services Department along with the Customer Contact Center being consolidated. Uh, my question for you deals with, has the St. Louis, St. Louis Fed felt any of these consolidations, and what do they translate to? Yeah, great operational question about the Federal Reserve. Um, so there are 12 Federal Reserve Banks. Uh, originally, they were conceived of as making a sort of regional monetary policy, but before the ink was dry on the Federal Reserve Act in 1913, the world started changing immediately. And uh, the idea of regional markets or regional interest rates kind of went out the window as U.S. financial markets became more and more integrated over the last 100 years. So uh, the banks, have reacted to this in the last 25 years or so by specializing in various activities uh, so that the banks are not carbon copies of one another, but instead are specialized in certain activities that provide services back to the Federal Reserve System as a whole. So I can give you some examples. The uh, cash operations, which we are the distributors of cash for the nation, it's about 10% of everything we do. That is uh, centralized in San Francisco. Uh, we distribute cash here in, Saint, in the St. Louis district, but uh, we do it at the direction and uh, the overall management of the cash, cash product office, which is in San Francisco. Um, the, uh, uh, the treasury business that you refer to is uh, the Fed is the fiscal agent uh, for the U.S. Treasury, according to the Federal Reserve Act. That means that the Treasury can give business to the uh, Fed to execute. A lot of that is not at the policy level, it's at the back office level. Uh, this means that there are projects, uh, most of them IT projects. Uh, the Treasury is a big place. It has trillions of dollars of payments that are made on a ongoing basis. So they've got lots of software systems that are trying to handle all these payments for all these different uh, uh, situations. And uh, those things need updating. They need uh, management. They need uh, you know better processes. They need upgrading. And we provide a lot of that service uh, in the Federal Reserve. That's about a $650 million uh, business. That's actually run out of the St. Louis Fed on uh, behalf of the whole uh, Federal Reserve System. Some of that business actually, uh, the, the actual work, some of it takes place in St. Louis, some of it takes place in Kansas City, some of it takes place in Cleveland, and just a few other places in the Fed. Uh, 
So we coordinate that entire business for the whole uh, Federal Reserve System. So that's another example of specialization uh, within the Federal Reserve System. There are many other examples. The retail product office is in Atlanta. Uh, the National Incident Response Team is in New York. Uh, so there are many, uh, National IT is in Richmond. So there are many examples where the uh, system has adapted to the modern era and has uh, set up as a major corporation would with uh, certain activities taking place in certain locations and, uh, and those locations expected to manage that and then provide service all the way back to uh, uh, the Federal Reserve System as a whole. So. I guess I can ask my students why uh, some of the costs of inflation are, some of the costs of deflation. So I'm guessing they're possibly wondering why is the Fed target 2% inflation instead of, say, 0%? That's a beautiful question, and it's one I've worked on in my own research. There is a whole literature on the optimal long run uh, rate of inflation. Um, general conclusion from that literature is lower is better. And so why not zero? Why not even a negative rate? Uh, as uh, Friedman argued on some occasions. Uh, there's another wing of the profession that thinks uh, that you should, you know, maybe a little bit more positive inflation would be a better outcome for the U.S. economy. And that based on that whole intellectual debate that went on during the 80s and 90s, uh, the, an international standard developed, which was a 2% inflation target. The U.S. was a latecomer to this international standard. It was really led by uh, Reserve, tiny Reserve Bank of New Zealand, uh, Reserve Bank of, uh, uh, sorry, the Bank of England, and then many other uh, central banks fall, fell in line. The U.S. was a laggard on this, and so we adopted the 2% international standard. Uh, whether that's really right or not, or whether that's really truly the optimal inflation rate uh, in the long run, I think is a great uh, research question. I actually have research myself that suggests a lower rate, uh, but uh, this, is, uh, this is where we are today. I will say, though, for a long time, we didn't have any inflation target. So from a kind of management perspective, we were not telling the world what we wanted to do, which is what do we want to do? We want to keep inflation low and stable. So I think a lot of the sentiment about choosing the 2% inflation target was it's more important to have a target as opposed to not have a target where uh, inflation could blow up on you. It's more impor important to have a target, and whether it's 2% or 1% or 0 is less important than just having a target. And so I think that's where some of the uh, logic of the current target came from. I want to just say one other thing about that. The inflation target in Europe is actually 2% or less. So if you hear them talk about it, they, uh, you know, you hear Mario Draghi on TV, he always says 2% or less. So it's always the or less is always in there, and that's because they uh, they did uh, maybe have more sympathy to the idea that infla lower inflation lower than two percent was fine. Uh, they weren't worried about inflation lower than two percent. What they were worried about is inflation getting out of hand and going to ten percent or fifteen percent, as it did in the 1970s. Um, so recent metrics like the cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio tend to suggest that the U.S. equity market is pretty significantly overvalued. Um, do you think there's a bubble in the equity market? And uh, where do you think this bubble is stemming from if you do think there's a bubble? Yeah, I think uh, bubble is a strong uh, word. Uh, I do think equity valuations may be stretched. And uh, when you look at the rise in US equities, uh, certainly the whole market is up. But uh, a lot of this is associated with a few stocks uh, that are usually talked about as tech stocks and that they have exceptional valuations. I don't have any better arguments for or against what the valuations of those companies should be, but they've been a, a, a big um, uh, 
a big uh, component of the rise in the U.S. equity market. So a lot depends on what you think about those companies and whether they are, on the one hand, uh, the, the pro hand would be that they're revolutionizing American business and therefore they're extremely valuable. Uh, the other side would be that uh, there's a lot of hype around them and they're maybe not as valuable as you would think. I don't know any better than the market on uh, what those those prices should be. But I think you should always keep in mind when you're looking at U.S. equities, it's not every single uh, equity is not trading at that uh, th these really high valuations. Um, so you talked about it a little bit in your presentation, um, uh, unemployment falling to levels of averages of 2006 and 2007. Uh, but at the same time, the labor force participation rate has been declining. So what does full employment in the U.S. look like, and are we getting close to that area? Yeah, I, th I would say on, f on uh, whether there's slack in the labor market, I guess I'd say two things. Uh, you probably won't see in the U.S. a better labor market than we have today. So I think uh, this is probably uh, as good as it gets uh, in the U.S. Uh, certainly if you look at U.S. macroeconomic history, uh, it's, it's very good on many dimensions. And so, but the question of whether there's slack or not is maybe not as important for monetary policy because in this calculation that I showed you in the end here, it's really the relationship between uh, labor markets and inflation that has changed over the 20 years. And it's, you know, in the statistics, it's the coefficient there that's relating the labor market back to inflation. That thing has gone down, down, down and looks like it might have gone all the way to zero. So whether you think there's a lot of slack over here or not much slack over here, the fact is that's not translating very well into whatever's going on with inflation. So the connection between labor markets and inflation, it's that connection that has uh, weakened substantially uh, over the last 20 or 25 years. And uh, you know it might have been a totally different thing in the 70s or the 60s, but it's whatever it is, it's very weak today. And so whether you think there's a lot of slack over here or not is maybe not as important as it, as it used to be. Um, labor force participation rate uh, has uh, fallen, uh, but I, I actually have a whole article on this called The Rise and Fall of Labor Force Participation in the U.S. Uh, I think it's a 2014 article in our review. You can check it out. But if you don't want to check it out, you can just listen for the next 20 seconds. Uh, you know, labor force participation was low in the 50s and 60s. It rose to a peak, uh, pretty uh, consistently rose to a peak in 2000, not 2008, 2000, and then it has fallen ever since 2000. And if you write down demographic models to talk about that, you will get very accurate predictions of what has happened. So that's has made me think this is a slow moving demographically influenced variable, labor force participation. It does depend a lot on aging of the U.S. economy, but it also depends on changing uh, composition of the labor force in the U.S. and changing propensities of certain groups to participate in the labor market. So I think it's mostly a demographic issue. If you look at the data just recently in the last uh, year or two years, it has the decline has flattened out. Uh, and maybe that's because of very strong labor markets. Um, but I wouldn't see this as an important cyclical variable that is telling us a lot about what's going to happen to inflation going forward. All right, thanks for an interesting talk. And sort of on this um, topic, I was wondering if there hasn't been a uh, delinking de between productivity raises and wages. And the Economist Magazine and Krugman have talked about that, that maybe what we're seeing is, yes, people are coming into the workplace, but they're not being paid as much. And then um, some of the inflation that's not being captured might be in medical inflation. That might come directly at the expense of wages, especially for people in the me middle to the bottom. And um, I would also imagine with the increasing inequality, the multiplier effect may be off by quite a bit, because people in the lower classes spend nearly everything they get in wages, whereas people at the top spend, what, 30 cents on the dollar or something like that? And so I was wondering if that might 
that the no increase of minimum wage, the, the lack of wages tied to productivity um, might not be part of the lack of the trade-off between unemployment wages and this low growth. Okay, uh, so it's true. So first of all, if you look at the Fed's favorite measure of wage growth, which is uh, ECI, uh, Employment Compensation Index, it's about, and you look at it year over year, it's about 2.5%. And the way I like to think about that number is that productivity growth has been averaging about a half a percent, and you would expect wages to move with productivity, or total compensation, really, to move with productivity. And then add on 2% inflation to that, you get to 2.5%. So, and, and if, you're, if you don't want to add on 2% inflation, only add on 1.5% inflation, and then actually real wages have been going up. So, um, so I'm not as sure that it's in as inconsistent as what people say. If you look at it compared to the 1960s or something, you might say, well, wage growth was higher, real wage, or nominal wage growth was way higher in the past. But is that really the way we should look at it? You would expect nominal wage growth to be low in a low inflation environment, and then you add on to that, it's a low productivity growth environment, and those are the two things that you would expect to feed into nominal wages, and therefore, that's why we have low nominal wage growth. So I don't see the 2.5% ECI number as being con inconsistent with my regime notion. We're slow growth, we're low productivity, we're low inflation. Given those factors, this is about where you'd expect wage growth to be. So that's my uh, basic story on wages. Now, uh, uh, I think the total compensation idea is critically important for this wage story. Uh, you gotta think about uh, how are, uh, how's the whole, the whole compensation package changing for the American uh, workforce. And one of the things that has happened over the last uh, couple of decades is uh, benefits uh, tend not to be taxed, and, and uh, uh, whereas your cash compensation tends to be taxed. So how do firms react to that? They say, hey, I'll give you more in the, uh, in the benefits component and less in the cash component, and that's been growing uh, over time. So you really have to look at the whole package of compensation. That's one thing that the ECI does better than, uh, than other measures of wages. You've also got promises, when you're, when you're paying an employee, you've got promises, something about pensions or future payoffs or something out laying out their retirement programs, laying out their, their in the future. Those actually have different amounts of value to people that are different stages in the life cycle. So you gotta think about that in compensation. That often doesn't get handled in compensation measures. And just one other thing about this. So we've been we talk about this a lot among my staff. So we're very excited about it. this. is an exciting thing in the in the macro world. Um, the uh, you know you look at this picture that says median wages have only increased seven uh, percent since 1985. Pe politicians often cite this as evidence that. Uh, average person or the median person is not any better off than they were since the middle, uh, middle of the 1980s. But if you look at per capita income, real per capita income is approximately doubled uh, since, the, since the 1980s. So what the heck? What the heck is going on? Why is the median guy uh, flat? And then when you look at the total income or per capita income in the economy, it's doubled. That would say we're twice as well off as we were in the 1980s. And I was around in 1985, and I'd say we're about twice as, twice as well off. But so one thing is happening is the definition of household is changing, has changed over time. So what you're doing is you're taking that rising real income, and you're dividing it by more and more households. So what you got to think of is like a household that gets divorced. So if you took that household combined income, uh, you would have uh, some amount of income for the household. The household gets divorced, now you've got two uh, households, uh, but you basically have the same amount of income, so the household uh, income goes way down. That has happened in spades uh, over since 1985 in the U.S. economy. Uh, 
it's changing societal uh, norms, change, you know, maybe more divorce, other single households, other types of households. And because of that, uh, that has happened more than the income has gone up, and so it looks like household income has stagnated. But the economy as a whole, if you look at real per capita income, approximately doubled uh, over this time period. So I just think it's something to keep in mind about that particular uh, statistic about stagnating uh, median wages in the U.S. economy. But points about income inequality are, are certainly true, and that's been rising. Yeah. So. Thank you uh, for your talk. And I'm of the opinion that our natural progression as a society is towards a almost fully automated society with a sort of universal basic income um, to the point that it will allow for uh, more, almost kind of wage insurance and cutting edge growth. Um, from a regulatory perspective, how, how do you approach that and prepare the nation and the world for that as we progress as a society? Okay, uh, so this is the this is another great question in uh, macroeconomics, and I saw a uh, brilliant paper by David Autor, who's from MIT, this year. I saw it a couple months ago. Best title I've ever seen. It's called Robocalypse Now. <laughs> so this is the idea that uh, robots are going to take over all our jobs, and uh, there won't be anything for us to do. And uh, how are we going to run a society that operates like that? So uh, what uh, Autor does, and you can go get the paper yourself, but um, the nutshell is he's very good with data. He's very good at the sectoral level. Uh, he's very good at analyzing things and then making clear what the results are. But the idea is you'd look at a particular sector of the economy and you would look at when productivity improves in that particular sector does employment go down? And then what happens to the sectors that are kind of closely related to that particular sector? And the answer is super clear coming out of the data. Uh, when the, the productivity goes up in the sector, uh, that sector hires less people. And then uh, the related sectors, unemployment or employment goes up in these related sectors. And so on net, you get more jobs than you would have had before. So that makes a lot of sense, and I think uh, is the story of technology in the U.S. over the last hundred years. Um, I think you have to put keep in mind that automation has been occurring uh, ever since the Industrial Revolution got started. People have been predicting ever since the Industrial Revolution got started that, uh, that there would be no more jobs, there would be nothing for anybody to do, and this would all end in disaster. And that has not happened. And the leading example is agriculture. Uh, agriculture would have had 50% of all employment in the U.S. in 1900 or so. And it, today it's about 1%. But just because all those people had to leave the farm, including my father uh, and my uh, uh, other people in my family, uh, that didn't mean that they, uh, they didn't work. It uh, doesn't mean that we have 49% unemployment today. Instead, other industries developed, other sectors uh, started to come into play that wouldn't have been thinkable even in 1900, and uh, whole industries arose and people started working in these other industries. So freeing up labor from uh, relatively menial tasks into uh, more uh, maybe interesting work has been the whole story of the U.S. economy for a very long time and will continue to be the story of the U.S. economy. And uh, sure, short term, it's going to mean transition and change, but long term, it's uh, making us all much better off than we would have been. And if you don't believe me, uh, okay, you go back to 1900 and you live the way people lived in 1900 and throw away all your toys and all your machines and, uh, and tell me what you think about that. So, okay, I think, so we got one more? Sure, I'll have one more. Uh, so some of the uh, predictions that you had up there uh, for uh, the predicted growth rates seemed pretty high. Uh, I think there was one that was like 3.7% uh, that was put out by the St. Louis Fed. I think it might have been the St. Louis Fed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so that just seems like pretty ridiculously high. Uh, 
uh, especially with like recent trends. So I was kind of wondering uh, how that prediction was made and what purpose those uh, types of predictions serve. Like yeah. who's paying attention to that? Because it seems like if you put that up on a headline, you know, everyone would think that the St. Louis Fed doesn't know what they're talking about. But, <laughs> you know, obviously that's not the case. Oh, no, we do. Uh, <laughs> so um, that is a big number. But I would say those are quarterly growth numbers at an annual rate. So, you know, they bounce around a lot. And it, it is possible to have, you know, 4% growth, even 5% growth for a quarter. It's hard to get that kind of growth rate for many quarters, which is what we'd all like to see. But uh, uh, based on the very early data, the July data for um, the third quarter, and ours is an economic news index, so uh, the, the which is relying partly on reactions in financial markets. Uh, you know, it was saying based on past relationships with this kind of news, here's the growth rate that you'd expect to see in this quarter, and it was 3.7 percent. That has all been revised down a lot uh, since then. But this is really uh, interesting game, I think, of that has developed uh, in the last few years about tracking the economy on a day-to-day -day basis and, and, and giving a forecast based on every day's uh, data. And uh, this has become possible because of better and better technology. Um, the, uh, you know, it used to be you would get the jobs report and the industrial production report and you know, an international trade report, and then you'd have to give it to your guys, and they'd have to fiddle around for a while, and then they, uh, with their slide rules, and then they'd come back out with the number. But that's all automated now, so you can, uh, you can just uh, take today's number, which was the uh, durable goods uh, number that came out, feed it into the model, boom, you can have a new GDP forecast based on the very latest uh, data. So the, uh, the kingpin of this is the Atlanta Fed GDP Now, uh, which has become very popular on Wall Street. It's basically, I think it's weekly, but it could be daily. Uh, they're, they're updating uh, their GDP forecast. So these forecasts are like moving around uh, daily. I think this has been a, a great innovation. It shows you a couple things about how you're tracking the economy. It do is affected uh, as new information comes in. Sure, they had penciled in a number for today's uh, durable goods report, but the actual number came in as something a little bit different. Feed that through the model, see what that says about GDP growth for this quarter and for the uh, future quarter. So you're tracking uh, maybe more accurately and a more timely basis uh, what's going on in the economy. I think this could be much, much better than it is today. And let me give you a leading example. In business, uh, businesses will spend a lot to get their information systems to be really, really good and to give them exact, up-to-date information on a daily basis or even a real-time basis. And uh, a leading example is Walmart This did this a long time ago. They can tell you in real time how much they're selling at every one of their stores all around the world and they can tell you how many bottles of uh, Selsun Blue they're selling, and they can tell you how many loaves of bread they're selling and everything at all their stores in real time. And why have they done that? Because it's very important to their business, and it's uh, critically important to tuning their cost structure and getting it exactly right so they can be as profitable as they can be. This is why they've been uh, incredibly successful. You know, do we see that when we're tracking the macro economy and making public policy? We do not see it, and it could, so it could be done uh, much better than it is today. Uh, all the information's out there. A lot of the information is available in real time. Uh, if you could find a way to gather it together, uh, you could track the economy much more accurately, which I think would be an important uh, advance in public policy making. So that lies in the future, uh, but for today we have Atlanta Fed GDP now. So you guys have been great, uh, a lot of great questions here. I really appreciate the opportunity to come in today, and I'll be around for a few minutes afterwards if you want to talk more. So thanks very much.